Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and Lord, and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we're really going to be looking at both of our readings, but we'll finally end up in uh, Lamentations chapter 3, beginning in verse 31. And so to put the end at the beginning, for the Lord will not cast off forever. But though he cause grief, he'll have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men. The writer Charles Swindoll tells about a time in his life when he was particularly overwhelmed with all that was happening at work. He said it was that type of period where everything just kept piling up over and over upon him, so much so that he noticed he was starting to get a little snippy and a little more irritable, especially at the uninterrupted or unexpected interruptions that kept arriving. It was one of those periods where it kept building up so much so that that began to spill over into the rest of his life. And his family at home was starting to notice so much so that after dinner one night, his daughter approached him and said, Daddy, I need to tell you something and I'll tell it to you really fast. And so he responded saying, Honey, you can tell me anything. And you don't have to say it really fast. Say it slowly. To which she responded, then listen slowly. And isn't that the challenge, to slow down, to be able to listen slowly? This is the season where we naturally do that, isn't it? With the oppressive heat that's upon us, we all tend to move just a little bit slower, recognizing how exhausting the heat can be. But it's even more than just the heat. Summer is supposed to be the time of vacations and relaxations. The time where you can get away to your back deck and just sit and enjoy the moment. But it's hard to slow down with the to-do list that we have and the work projects that build up and the doctor's appointments that are always looming before us. This season, like every season, is one that we trade the busyness of the last time to the busyness of today. And when life doesn't move fast enough, or at least to what we need to survive, frustration easily begins to mount. And frustration... As we'll see in our text today, frustration always leads us to do the unexpected, oftentimes the bad unexpected. But as we struggle to slow down, what we see is that same struggle playing out in our text today, Jeremiah or, uh, Lamentations 3 and Mark chapter 5. Now frustration, uh, at least psychologically uh, defined, frustration is the perceived resistance to the fulfillment of a goal. Notice it's the perceived resistance. It doesn't necessarily mean there is a barrier preventing you from reaching the desired outcome. Just the perception of one will create that frustration within. And the closer you are to that ultimate goal, whatever it might be, the greater the frustration becomes because it seems like, it feels like, the greater that barrier becomes in our minds. And so whether it's a parent, like in our earlier story, a parent who gets frustrated by the many questions or the slow telling of stories or the frustrations of a season that does not slow down, Or, as we see in our gospel text, the frustrations of a guy struggling with the health of a family member. Mark chapter 5, verse 22. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing Jesus, fell at his feet and imposed him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Can you hear the the fear, the, the worry, even the frustration in his voice as he is saying this? He's tried everything. His, his daughter, one who he dearly loves, her life is at risk. And he's pulling out all the stops to find that last bit of help that he can find. He's out of all options. Everything has failed. He's tried prayers. He's tried the doctors. He's tried every option and nothing is working and frustration is mounting. And did you catch who he was? A Jairus, a leader in the synagogue a ruler in the synagogue. 
And so this is a guy who, with his group, by reputation, is against Jesus. They are the ones who are constantly trying to trap him, to turn people against him, and ultimately to crucify him. And yet this is a guy who, associated with them, is willing to put everything on the line, put everything at risk in order to come to Jesus. He is doing what is completely unexpected, as frustration leads us to often do what we would least expect. So with his reputation on the line, he places himself at the feet of Jesus. And you can imagine the humiliation. He's been wrestling with, what do I do? And he knows Jesus is in town and his heart is beginning to race as he starts to walk closer and closer, knowing what the crowd and his friends are going to be saying, knowing that he is risking his career as he may be kicked out for coming to Jesus for help, knowing that his friends might reject him entirely and abandon him for doing what they have been pledging to not do. Frustration leads him to do the unexpected, and when he reaches out to Jesus, he finds an invitation and, in fact, an acceptance of love and support. So Jesus says, yes, let's go to your house. And as they start to do that, he's touched. Jesus is touched by the woman bleeding for 12 years. It's really a funny interaction, isn't it? Verse 30, Jesus says, who touched my garments? And the disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you, and you say, who touched my garments? I mean, wouldn't there have been many people that were touching Jesus at that time as they're all rushing together to hear his word, to receive what they want, to get some sort of benefit from him? So standing around, looking confused, having felt the power go out from him, what does that even mean? Can you imagine just feeling something drain from you so quickly, so unexpectedly? So Jesus, standing there looking around, confusion in the crowd, this woman approaches, and she begins to tell her story. And that's all we hear, see is that phrase, uh, she begins to tell her story, and yet you know, we know enough details to piece it together. She starts talking, uh, my life was good, but then all of a sudden it became different. I uh, began to bleed, uh, 12 years, uh, weaker, and weaker, and oh, the physicians, and the, the pain, no more money, I just thought if, if I could touch your garment. And it's a beautiful story as Jesus responds to her in, in compassion, in steadfast love, as Lamentation says. But remember Jairus. Jesus now is paused, talking to this woman, and there's Jairus on the other side of the street doing that dance of frustration, anger beginning to swell, smoke coming from his ears, saying, Jesus, what are you doing? Knock it off. Quit being distracted. You said you were helping me. Come to me. Let's go. My daughter is near death. Remember Jairus, he's top of society. We talked about that, ruler of the synagogue. This woman, she's completely the opposite, isn't she? She is the socially uh, outcasted, completely separated, or at least she should be. Numbers chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, talk about three groups of people that should be removed from the camp of Israel. They are the lepers, those who have contacted the dead, and then the third group, those with a bodily discharge. And they were ritually and socially unclean until they went for, through the purification rite. And here's one who falls into that category, who has rejected all of those cultural trends and completely entered into the crowds, putting herself at risk once again to find comfort from Jesus. And God brings healing as he always does. Whether it's to Jairus and his family as he perceives Jesus completely distracted or to the woman who is bleeding who felt like she was about to be passed by and just reached out for a little bit of help. Frustration, it's everywhere in this story, isn't it? And it's everywhere in our lives. And you know this to be true. Frustration we find all the time, whether it's we are the one who is following the slowest car in all of Henry County who happens to be in front of us on 424. You know frustration as you're waiting hours, even days, for those test results to finally come back. You know frustration as you see that date on the calendar you've been anticipating forever and it seems to be going the opposite direction from you. You know frustration as you wait for the affection to finally arrive from a spouse who has felt so distant in recent times. 
You know frustration as you call your kids, begging them to call you back and no contact to be received from them. You know frustration as your line in the grocery store is always the longest and the slowest. And it's not just us. All of creation is continually struggling with the frustrations of a rebellious nature and of the sin that has caused us to be in conflict. And you know this to be true. We see it at home every day, don't we? What's the fir- if you've got a dog, what's one of the first things that, that happens when you arrive home that day? And you open the door, but the dog attacks you, doesn't he? And jumps up, licks you, It's so excited to see you because the dog has been in frustration for all day waiting for you to finally arrive home. All of creation is struggling in this time of frustration. We're all waiting, and it's not an easy wait for us as we are longing for the fulfillment of our heart and for that steadfast love of Jesus to finally appear. It's as if he's distracted for us because other people are getting it. We're seeing them find comfort. But us? It's different. We know this will pass, we're promised that, but it always passes so slow and so difficultly for us. Jairus knew frustration. He knew hope in Jesus. He was willing to break all cultural boundaries to make that that satisfaction, that, that compassion finally be realized in his life. And yet, he knew frustration. And his frustration led him to do the unexpected. And that's what we see in Lamentations as well. Jeremiah, speaking in a time when all of Israel is destroyed, uh, writes a beautiful book, one that's often overlooked. If you're ever in a period where that frustration is building, where uh, sorrow, where depression is there, read Lamentations, a short book. And for the first two and a half chapters, Jeremiah is just in anguish as his heart is breaking, as pain is not just a, a concept, but is real in his life. And then, Then he gets to today's text, verse 22. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Imagine this from God's perspective for a moment. His mercies are new every morning. You think God ever wakes up in the morning with us? Well, God never sleeps, so he's not waking up. But you think God ever sees us waking up, and he hears our prayers in the morning of what we desire, what we're asking for, and You think he ever is responding out of frustration as well? Are you serious? You prayed that last week. Don't you know I'm already taking care of this? I'm giving you new mercies. You have them right now. You think he ever gets tired of some of what we have to say? But in our sin, we don't understand. In our sin, we can't see. In our sin, we can't perceive. And so it seems like from our perspective, it would make sense for God to be frustrated. Ah, it's a new morning. Here we go again. These people that are completely inept and can't care for themselves, that are always needy and asking, here comes the mercies once again. You would think that could be the case. But our text, verse 31 and following, the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love, for he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men. He will not afflict from his heart. God's heart is not one of frustration. It's not one of distraction. It's not one where he easily grows tired of those people around him or, or us who beg him constantly. God does not afflict from his heart because his heart is full of compassion and steadfast love and we see that see when frustration for jesus begins to mount because of the sin and the rebelliousness of his people he instead sends jesus god in the flesh so you want evidence that jesus is not one of or that god is not one of frustration but instead is one of compassion look to jesus For in the frustration of sin, he promised a Savior and he delivered. And Jesus experienced that frustration firsthand, didn't he? As he overturns the tables in the temple, frustrated that they had turned his father's house, a house of prayer now, into a house of robbers and trade. We see the frustration of Jesus as he's in the garden shouting and crying, Father, remove this cup. And as if God is distracted once again, God does not respond. The Father does not respond to that prayer, but instead pours that cup completely upon Jesus. And even upon the cross. As he was mocked and and invited to come down from that cross and receive relief, 
Jesus instead endures the frustration of death itself. Accused of blasphemy, lied about at trial, he was silent. He could have easily responded to the attacks and responded to all that was done against him, and yet frustration led him to do the unexpected, to submit and trust in the Father's will and to express that compassion for you. And as our frustration begins to mount this day or any day, we turn to Jesus and we see his promise poured out for us once again. We are renewed and reminded of what he has done and how God cares for you greatly in Jesus. Jairus, he's left standing on the side of the road, afraid that Jesus became distracted and that he wouldn't fulfill his promise. But we know that God responded and God cared for him so much so that he raised his daughter to life. And from our limited perspective and clouded in sin, it's easy for us to miss how God is working right now in our lives. For God cares for you and he loves you and he does all of this out of his compassion for you. And often as we're left wanting, we're left not alone, for we are together with one another. And we're left with hope, a sure and certain hope, as Jesus is not just a magician, he's not just a healer, but he is God in the flesh who comes to bring us the blessing of the new creation. And as we experience that old creation and the frustration that it brings, we know that Jesus is present constantly, restoring you and renewing you once again. And as Charles Swindoll's daughter reminded him to listen slowly, sometimes we need that reminder as well. For it's hard to listen, and it's hard to hear God's compassion when we are so running and so busy in life. And that's why. That's why we gather today and every Sunday to slow down once again and hear those words. And even as we're here, it's easy for us to respond and really to worship like Jairus, right? To be tapping our toes and twiddling our thumbs and saying, this has to come to an end at some point. This is the biggest waste of my time. I could be doing so much more. I could be sleeping in my bed at home. And there are so many options that we could do instead. And to the world, many of those seem like better options. But it's when we're here. It's when we're here that we have a chance to take a breath and to reflect once again, to hear the promise that our God is not distracted, that our God does not have a vendetta against you, that our God does not grow weary or exhausted with you, but instead loves you dearly, cares for you completely, and responds with compassion. It's here that we hear that promise once again of your baptismal identity, that you are a child of God, and that as Lamentation says, the Lord does not cast off forever. And we need that message weekly. We need to hear it regularly, to slow down and listen slowly. Sometimes slower than others, but we all need to hear it as our frustration leads us to do the unexpected. And you know what that's like. But today, our frustrations are poured out upon the unexpected one. Jesus, who has come to us in the flesh to remind us God does not get distracted and he is not distracted in your life, but he cares for you completely. And if you need evidence, look to the cross and the resurrection for you. Amen. And now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds together with Christ Jesus our Lord.